I, I have to say, when I selected, uh, well, when I actually set up almost the entire R&D activities in China, a lot of people say, aren't you afraid of them, you know, copying because don't you know about the Pfizer Viagra case and so on. And so my answer actually is not because I have much stronger faith in today's IP environment, protection environment in China, although it is definitely drastically improving. My argument is that people will only steal something if they can get immediate benefit. So the fact that Viagra got violated in terms of patent, that's because it's a marketed drug. Everyone knows the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So therefore, and it is selling, it is a real drug and it's working and so on. That's why there are copycats. For us to operate our discovery in preclinical in China, the best we can come up with is a pre-IND candidate. And if anyone steals that, they will have to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in order to get to the market. No one is crazy enough to steal something that's not actually generating revenue. So my confidence in terms of operating in China depends on the fact that if you are actually working in an area where your IP is actually not perceived to generate immediate value, then thieves won't bother you. Of course, you know, if we generate a, a drug that's really selling billions, then it's irrelevant whether it was not it was discovered in China or discovered in the United States because the patents will have been published. So I would say I'm confident about the Chinese uh, IP environment being improving, but then at the same time, one should be careful about what to do in China and what not to do yet at this moment. And that's why I do uh, advocate for a st partnership strategy if you're dealing with uh, especially in the therapeutic side, dealing with Chinese market, because first of all, to actually operate in the Chinese market really does take a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot of resources that small companies do not have. And partnering with a Chinese company or partnering with a global pharmaceutical company, they have much, much bigger negotiating power and lobbying power. So if there's anything that happens, the Chinese government would not really want that to be. Uh, damaging the China's reputation. So, but if you're a small company, you don't get on the radar screen, then it, it's tougher. And so that's why the Pfizer at Viagra case was so prominent because it's Pfizer that's fighting it. But if it's like, you know, little biotech company, A, B, and C, we may not even hear about it. Mm -hmm. uh, since we were a small molecule therapeutic company, and the important thing for choosing an attorney is to choose an attorney that's not only a good attorney, or you know, in IP law, but also someone who truly understands the science that we're doing, because that becomes really important when it comes to prosecuting, you know, what patents to file, how to file the patents, and this way, the scientist and the attorney can actually have the same language to speak, and that's why we went out to pick an attorney with a PhD in chemistry, because we're an NCE company, and someone who understands organic chemistry, not just any chemistry, is very important for us, and this way, he not only actually can file good patents, he can actually guide us in terms of oh, which molecules to cover and what molecules not to cover because he thinks not only from a attorney standpoint but also from a drug discoverer standpoint. And I think that kind of uh, bridging ability is very important for a small therapeutic company, small molecule therapeutic company.